We get, this has got a little caffeine. Equ that's all they say. Caffeine <clears throat> equals one cup of coffee. Are you going to be able to sleep having that sleep? Who are you talking to? I'll go to sleep at like a baby in 10. Are you ready? Yep. Welcome to the I Know Nothing podcast, where you will learn nothing. Today, we have one of my best friends in life, Mike Sicardo. He's in town. He came down. He just did about 2,000 reps of bicep curls, <laughs> just getting it in. My first question, Mike, is how many milligrams of caffeine are you on currently? Uh, we're upwards of probably 1,000. No, 1, it's a lot. I had a lot of caffeine. I was on the road early. All right. We, we're capping this at 30 minutes because him and I are going to get something to eat. Give us your elevator pitch of who you are, Mike, and why someone should listen to you who's an athlete or a parent of an athlete. Uh, so I am a former college athlete at the school you went to, SUNY Cortland. Played three years of baseball there. Um, played about 30 seconds of professional baseball for the Philadelphia Phillies organization. It counts. It counts. Back in 2008. Uh, since then, just living a professional life, worked in higher ed, currently... I work as a gift officer, which is a fundraiser for SUNY Brockport. Um, why should parents or athletes listen to me? Yes. I guess because I've reached, I guess, the highs and the lows of athletic performance. I mean, I've been, I've been to the lows of low um, playing baseball, having to battle through uh, you know, some, I guess, mental issues in terms of how to think when you're on the field. You know, it, I was always... It's always okay to be, you know, you're okay if you have the physical talent, but to really separate yourself, you got to have the mental ability to, to kind of work through your struggles. And I didn't learn that until I was probably a little too old uh, in the game. Um, but, you know, I, I think I've seen a lot of baseball. I've, I've been working out since I was 12 years old. I mean, you uh, and your bodybuilding common sense has really brought me to another level in terms of understanding the whole, I guess, basis of, of working out. Adding a, I'm not, I guess I'm not, I would say older age, but I'm, I started that when I was 35, 34, 35, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. an advanced age, and I've never been in better shape. So I've learned a lot about the body. I've learned a lot about working out, diet, nutrition from you. Um, so I guess if you're hearing it from me, you're hearing it from you. So that's why people should listen to me as well, because you're quite the, uh, you're quite the source. And I've seen a lot of baseball. I've seen a lot of youth sports. I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, Again, you take away, I say, with a grain of salt. Yeah. This is the name of the podcast. We know nothing, but I think um, just based off my credentials in baseball, what I've done, again, a lot of people have done way more than I have. But, um, you know, between me, you, Koff, Robbie Andrews, you know, a bunch of all of our friends, we've seen a lot of baseball. We've seen a lot of sports. So, Yeah, and I think, although I know nothing, I bring people on who know a lot of things. <laughs> you also coached at the college level too. So we're going to get into that. I want to, like, I want to build the story kind of, of, of your youth. I know all about like you growing up a little bit from what you've told me, but just take us through the sports that you played, you know, middle school, high school, everything that you did as a youth athlete from until you got to college. Right. So I played everything growing up. I mean, we played soccer, we played baseball, we played football, we played basketball. I mean, volleyball, whatever you were, where we can get our hands on, we played. And then when I got to, uh, you know, in the middle school, junior high, I started, you know, I was a three-sport athlete. I was playing basketball, I was playing football, and I was playing baseball. Um, then when I realized I probably wasn't going to grow anymore, mm. uh, I, stopped playing, I stopped playing basketball, and I focused on football um, in the fall, obviously, and then baseball in the spring, um, which honestly was, was probably really a pivotal decision for me in terms of maximizing my ability in both sports because I had a time to rest. You know, I would, mm -hmm. I would, I would, you know, I'd always go from, it would be football, basketball, baseball. And by the time I got to baseball, I was a little, that was before I really understood how to work out. I was kind of initiated, you know, I was, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was kind of skinny and, um, and tired, uh, you know, having that break in the winter allowed me to, to work out and get my swing down and get my arm ready for the, for the, for the spring. So I wasn't kind of playing catch up. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up playing everything. I grew up working out. My dad got me in the gym, I think, when I was 12. There you go. Working out. You know, I didn't really take it seriously until I was about 20 years old. I mean, we, we lifted for football, but that was mostly just kind of a meathead kind of, mm -hmm. I want to squat as much as I can. I want to bench as much as I can. 
that's going to help me be a better athlete. Yeah, good luck. So, um, but it wasn't really until I got to college when I got on a, on, on a routine, as you know, at SUNY Corbin, we had a phenomenal uh, workout routine in the, in the off season that I got really serious about um, working out. Yeah, and the thing that I want to highlight what you said is like you had, you had off seasons from real sport growing mm -hmm. up we have had the same conversation on every single podcast where right now kids are not getting an off season. And when they even have an off season, they're getting berated. Like in the, we're in the summer right now and half of our kids have extra conditioning. We got to go to this. You're not, you're not going to make the varsity team if you don't go to this run. And it's just ridiculous. And that's why you're just watching injuries get super mm -hmm. normalized. So again, you're just reiterating something we've talked about on this podcast a lot. I really don't know much about this. So I wanted to ask like, what, what was your recruiting process like for you? For baseball or did you get recruited for football too i mean i got recruited for football but it wasn't serious i mean i wasn't a very good quarterback um i threw the football hard and a long way but um can anybody catch on your team <laughs> if i threw it in the right if i threw it at them yeah right. but you know sometimes that was that was really hard to do my accuracy wasn't great i, I could throw but I, I wasn't a great football player i just was an athlete i could play i could run um my recruiting process for baseball was pretty slim actually uh out of high school I didn't play a lot of travel ball. I didn't go. I wasn't a great showcase player. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't. You got to come see me. You had to come see me play. Right. To watch me play in, in high school. And that didn't happen a lot because I wasn't really out there. I played Legion ball. I didn't play a lot of travel ball. I didn't, you know, I didn't really travel to do any, any special sort of um, uh, like showcases, college showcases. Right. I did one showcase up. It was called the, the Doyle baseball camp. It doesn't even exist anymore. Brian Doyle and his brother. Brian Doyle is a famous Yankee, oh, yeah, um, yeah. you know, from the 78 World Series. They ran a, they ran a baseball camp. It was a Doyle showcase in, at Niagara. And I had one good showcase in my life, and that was it. Um, I hit the ball really well. My, I, threw, I threw the hell out of the ball from behind the plate, and the coach from Niagara recruited me, Mike McCray, who's currently now going to be the, um, I think, the pitching coach at Rutgers with Steve Owens, which is oh. Cortland Connection oh, there. Wow. Okay. Um, but I wasn't ready. That was the best decision, yeah. decision I ever made. I wasn't ready to be a Division One athlete. I wasn't, I wasn't mentally ready. I wasn't physically ready. Um, so I went to MCC, played a year there, um, ended up quitting baseball for reasons that we don't have long enough to, 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 to talk about. But I had a very good year my first year. Had some D1 offers from, um, I had Pitt. I had um, Central Michigan and Purdue uh, talking to me. You know, and I was going to do visits, but then I, I quit. Um, I see, I ended up being a, looking back, I ended up being a great decision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even though it was a tough time for me because then I landed at SUNY Cortland. I wasn't even recruited at SUNY Cortland. I called Coach Brown uh, and I asked him if I could try out for the team one fall. And, um, you know, lo and behold, that was when 2005, the, that was the summer of 2000, the spring of 2005 into the summer, and they were national runner ups that year. So I didn't really need any right. another pitch to go the right, court. Right. So I went there and, um, you know, as you know, ended up starting for two out of the three years at Cortland, had a great time, had a great experience. Uh, and that's, I wasn't, my college baseball career kind of, I, mean, I was recruited to MCC, but then after that, after I quit, kind of had to do my own recruiting, which was my fault. But um, it was kind of a not, it was a unique experience in terms of recruit, getting recruited and then landing yeah. where I did. I mean, now it's just, it's just so crazy with what's going on with recruiting. So I've been wanting everyone to just tell their story because it has, it has changed, but also too, like you had a unique situation. A lot of people have mm. been transferring schools. It's just, it's good to hear. I don't want to go crazy on the Cortland because we will go crazy on Cortland, but you know, we've talked about it with Robbie, with cough. We're going to have coach Brown on at some point, but uh -huh. I just don't think people understand Cortland baseball and without going off on a tangent, you know, I'll tell my side of like when I saw your 2008 team, which was what, 38 games in a row. Yeah, we won so I had, games. you know, very briefly, this is not about me, but I had all these D1 looks, you know, low level D1, some, some big. And then I showed up at Cortland, Mike's senior year. And I had been to some D1 schools. And I'm like, wait, I'm looking at my dad going, what is this? <laughs> I'm watching all these units come out yeah. and they're all multi-sport athletes, yep. all of them could throw, hit, run, everything. Even the pitchers were athletes. And I'm just watching practice like, duh, why would I not be going here? Division three, who, what do I care? Right. 
And I just want you because you you know you've been at you you played at Cortland, you coached there for a while. I just want you to kind of like describe maybe just specifically to baseball and like the traditions and the culture of mm. what Cortland was like for you like as a ball player first before we get into the coaching side. Yeah, Cortland was exactly what I needed at the exact right time in my life. You know, I I got to Cortland as an undisciplined out of shape baseball player and athlete and then not and, and without discipline in my personal life mm-hmm. um and three years later i was a totally different man i was a grown man i was ready for the real world um you know i was ready to play like and play professional baseball for the limited time i did i was ready for that um you know Cortland taught you know Cortland taught me discipline it taught me to fight through adversity. I mean, Coach Brown, his famous line was weather the storm. You know, mm-hmm. when we were playing bad, when we were, had a tough stretch of school, when the weather was, was piss poor and we're, you know, we're out there in the, before the season starts, like, you know, weather the storm, weather the storm. You know, you guys are going to have to weather it all year because we were good. People, you know, we had, we had a, uh, you know, what they say, a, a mark on our back, a target on our back all year. Um, you know, he taught me to fight through adversity. He yeah. taught me to... He taught me to go even when I didn't want to go, if that makes sense. He taught me to go to the gym even when I didn't want to go. He taught me to go to class even when I didn't want to go because at the end of the day, you're going to feel better. Right. Um, and that's huge because you're not going to want to do things. I don't want to go to work some days. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to do certain adult activities that you have to do in order to become, a, I guess, a full-fledged member of society. You know, yeah, he, just, yeah. he taught me that. Um, and I'll tell you what. My first year there, my first fall, the fall of 2005, you talk about men. I played with the likes of Adam Sidebottom, Nick McPartland, Danny Maycock, um, Jimmy Bass Knight, Travis Robinson, John Giametta, Brian Hooper. They're all on, some of those guys were on the 08, 06, 07, yeah. 08 teams. Just guys, I remember I got to, and I won't, I know I don't want to take too long here because I know we got a limited amount of time, but I remember I got to, my, I got to the first practice in the fall in 2005. I got there 30 minutes before practice started. Yeah. And they were fully dressed, taking early BP, and I looked like an idiot. Mm-hmm. I ran on the field, and I remember Adam Sybottom and Nick McPartland took me aside. They're like, yo, we get here early here. Like, we get here early, we do our early work, and then we start practice. And I was never late again. I was never late yeah. again. I was an hour early at least to every practice, every game. You know, and then you, as you, as, you know, we're running in and out of the – um, locker room. By the time you hit the pavement, by the time you got in the locker room, you were running. Do they still run out of the I don't know. I was, I'm, I was asking say, Coach Coach Brown, Brown, I'm asking that question. But we ran. When the second you hit the yes. pavement at the baseball field, you jogged in mm-hmm. and then you jogged out. If you were caught walking, people would call you out. You know, and you learn accountability that way. I learned accountability at, at, at Cortland too. You're not, not to kind of get too into the weeds here, but um, going to Cortland, playing at baseball at Cortland was the best decision. I've ever made, and probably the, looking back now, almost 20 years later, you know, I've been, I've been out 16 years, so it's not, you know, it's not get crazy of 20, but best thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, and I think, obviously, I'm going to have on as many Cortland people as possible because the thing that I'm seeing, and I know I always talk about, about this with you, is I'm watching core values, like you're talking about, get missed at the mm-hmm. young levels. Mm-hmm. And it's happening because coaches, parents, other teammates are not holding each other accountable because no one's holding them accountable and no one's holding the adults accountable where I joke about like, Hey, are the Cortland guys still coming out of the locker room and running? Because that's what we did. There was no other way. And I, again, we see it in society and stuff like that, but that is a big piece of like what Cortland baseball is. And And I love when people are talking about it. So I can stop ranting about it where yes, it's division three baseball, but every time you meet someone who played at Cortland and you know anything about baseball, you know, you have someone who, is probably pretty good at ball, but yeah. is a good human and yeah. is someone who's got all of these values that honestly, I- I'm just watching dissipate. And I think sports can teach us this. Like you're saying, I get be- playing baseball at Corlin changed your life because of all these values you've learned. A thousand percent, yeah. So I want to I want to talk about coaching because that's how Mike was actually my my coach first. So we didn't we never got to play together, unfortunately, but. We coached together, and that's how we became real close and became best friends. So, you know, from the coaching end of it now, like 
You've already went through the Cortland baseball as a player. Now go into the coaching of like the stuff, the, the takeaways you had, and then obviously, you know, we have stories together too, but what was your biggest takeaways from like coaching with Coach Brown at Cortland, all of it? Biggest takeaway from coaching, um, one, you see the game at a totally different level. You mm -hmm. see the game, you, it slows down for you. You see it, you break it down easier as, as you see more baseball, as you're, you're kind of taking a step back from a player. Um, it helped that I was a catcher, so I got to know, you know, I know the cuts. I know, I know pitching to a point. Um, you know, I know bunk coverages. I know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I, kn I knew a lot about the game. But then seeing how organized Coach Brown was in terms of, like, X's and O's, like, this guy – it taught me how to think ahead. It taught me how to plan ahead. I mean, not just in baseball, but just like thinking down the road in life, right? I mean, Coach Brown knew what was going to happen in the seventh inning. Right. I right. mean, he was – pitch one, he was already like, okay, what if this happens? I'm ready for the seventh inning. Where I'm, I was going my first couple of years of coaching like a bat to a bat. I'm like, mm -hmm. I didn't even know what's going on. But then by the time I was done, you know, I had, the, I had the approach where I was, you know, thinking an inning, two innings, three innings ahead. Um, that's how I brought that to my personal life. You know, you think a couple steps down the road, it helps you make better decisions, you know, right at, at this moment. Um, coaching at Cortland was just a grind. It taught mm -hmm. me to really grind out, you know, really, you know, I mean, from January until May, thankfully, we were good enough that we were playing until May. You were grinding an hour. I mean, you were there every weekend. You were getting up early, um, you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, running that Sunday clinic, which some of the greatest memories I've ever had, but <laughs> some of the most annoying wake-ups I've ever had too. Yeah. Um, you know, going to practice at 10 o'clock at night after you work all day, you have grad school or you do, you're doing this. So I'm going to really grind, you know, grind it out and, and, and suck it up and do the hard things to know that at the, end of the, at the end of the year, again, having discipline as a coach, knowing that at the end of the road, you're going to have, you're going to have relief and you're going to have success. So that's what really taught me is just be prepared you know, now in my personal life, you know, watching Coach Brown and, you know, I, I coached the likes of you, Alex Coffey, Casey Scott, Mike Hubbs was my coach in, in, uh, when, I was, when, I was a, when I was a player. And he was, I mean, they were so prepared. I mean, nobody was more prepared than Casey and Mike Hubbs, I think, that I've ever seen um, and on a pitching aspect, yeah. but in total, in total baseball. Um, and then Joe Brown as well. Um, it, I kind of took that on my personal life now at work, even at the gym. You know, you're like, I'm planning ahead. I'm, right. I have my week's plan for me I have my days planned I have you know my diets planned I have my social life planned it's like it all balloons and it all kind of it all leaks into your personal life so I don't know if that I answered that question very well but that's what it taught me just no. to kind of stay disciplined and even after my career was over and it was hard not to play it did teach me some other factors that have been allowed me to be successful well, it does answer the question because I think it's one of those basic concepts of you don't know what you don't know mm -hmm. and when you see, like, I remember going into coaching, and even though we were all together, like, watching Coach Brown prepare, I'm like, wow, I don't, I, I don't work hard. This dude works hard. So it right. teaches you how to work hard, and then once you know that level, uh -huh. there is no, you know, what are you going to do? You're not going to work hard anymore? Right. So you, you've learned it, and you coached for so long, like, that's not become ingrained in you. You know, your end of your coaching career, you got to be part of a national championship team, the yeah. only one at, at Cortland. So obviously, like, being a national champion, the importance of it, like how great that is, all those things matter. What I'm seeing, again, I'm always taking what I'm seeing and I'm gonna put it on you. Here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing now what matters more is me, me, me. Mm. I don't care about you, me, me, me. Oh, I didn't get my NIL deal. Ooh, is this school better? Is this school better? Is, right. it, is this gonna get me drafted? And it goes both ways. It's like, okay, you know what? Is it about, I wanna go and I wanna go play pro, so I don't really care about winning. Right. I think at Cortland, that's the difference. It's like when you go there, it's not about the next NIL deal. It's not about transferring out. It's like when you go there, your goal is to win a national championship. Coach yeah. Brown makes that clear. The, the alum make it clear. Can you just dive into the, that year specifically of the culture, mm -hmm. the locker room, the everything, and how, how that national championship happened and yeah. you know the pros, cons, all of it? <laughs> well, first and foremost, we probably had four number one starters on that team. So we we were deep. that helps. Yeah, we were deep. We were deep pitching. <clears throat> we had depth in our in our in our lineup. We had we had just a bunch of really good baseball players mm -hmm. on that team, and they were really good. I say kids, but they were really good young men. 
Um, you know, the likes of, you know, Austin Clock, Keith Andrews, Anthony Simon, Conrad Zemendor, you know, Matt Personius, Justin Teague. I can go on and on. Brandon Serio, we just, you know, we know the Serio family. Uh, Seth Lamondo is, you know, National Pitcher of the Year in 2016. In 2015, he got hurt, but he ended the year, and he was the best pitcher in the nation that mm -hmm. year, too. He just didn't have enough starts to, to, to qualify for that, for, that, um, for that award. We had a great coaching staff. I mean, a really, I mean, Kyle Putnam and, and, and Nick Anderson, uh, created some of the best scouting reports I've ever seen. Mm. And we were able to play through them, you know? And we had, we had the talent um, as a whole. And, that, that, and I've, you know, I've been on some really good teams. And you know, people always ask me, was that 2015 team better than some of the teams? You know, it's hard. It's, that's a long conversation to yeah. have. Um, but that team just really liked each other, too. Right, you know, right. they had a really good cohesion. Um, they were tight off the field as well on the field. And I tell you what, looking back on a stepping out, they were cocky. Yeah. You know, they were, but in a good way, they were arrogant, but in a, in a, not in a showboat. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. They were arrogant because they were a lot, they were good enough to be arrogant, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that come, that came from their preparation. They were, they were no, you know, once they caught, they got to practice that team, you know, everybody likes to have fun in college. We had fun as a baseball team. I know they did too, but once they got on the practice field, once they got in the, in the Lusk field house, once they got on Wallace field and any other ball field they played on, they were all business. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted to win. They wanted to beat you. And they wanted, they wanted to really beat you. They wanted to shove it in your face and they wanted to beat you. And they did. They brought it. I mean, they, that was the team that was this overly balanced and had great leadership um, and really bought in. They bought into everything that we taught them. You know, they, we bunted, we hit and run, we stole um, we turned a lot Shout of, out bunting. Yeah. Does that a, exist in baseball yeah, anymore? Right. I mean, we had guys, we had our bench players really come up. We had depth, man. I mean, we had, we caught some breaks. You have yeah. to, we caught some breaks in the regionals. We caught some breaks in the world series. You have to in a long season. Um, but yeah, I mean, they really bought into the Cortland way of baseball. They, mm -hmm. they ran hard. They played hard. Uh, you know, they, they just, they grinded it out. They were a bunch of dirtbags in a yeah. good way, you know? And yeah. that's a, that's a, that's a good nickname in baseball, you know? And they were, they were fun to coach and they were fun to watch. And it was not, a, you know, looking back, I mean, it was a magical year. They just, they really, um, you're never out of it with that team. They're never out of a game and you never, I was never nervous coaching that team, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so it was a special group, obviously the only person, people, the, the only team to win a national championship. We've been close. You've been close. I've been close. Um, but yeah, it's just, that was a special group. I mean, from what I'm hearing, and I unfortunately was not there that year, but I coached a lot of those guys. This wasn't an accident that they won a national championship. Right. And again, it goes back to my, my point. This group was <clears throat> Excuse me. prepared. They were, for the most part, all of them on the same page. I, I still remember the game knows going around. I still remember Austin Clock. I named my first podcast episode don't talk about it, be about it. I hear his voice saying it. Right. A cool thing that people don't understand is how many of those guys on that team are now super successful in their careers, right? right. It's not an accident. And like you said, there's, you have to have breaks, but the luck part of it was that you had this group of, maybe it was not the best ever statistically baseball team, but when they stepped on the field, that was a cohesive group mm -hmm. and that culture was about winning. Yeah. And just hearing you and hearing, obviously, Coach talk about that team, it's like, no, it wasn't an accident. No. They, they, they expected to win a national championship. They expected to win every pitch, and that's why they got to that point. And, I, yeah. and, again, I go back to my point of, like, what's the bigger picture that we're missing in sports is what it takes. You know what it takes to get to that point. Both, of, both you and I have played in World Series. You won a national championship as a coach. To get to that point, everything matters. When you get in the business end of the world, everything matters. When you have a family – all of those things matter, and I think we're just slipping. Again, it goes back to the core values. It goes back to being part of a team. And obviously, they still exist all over, at the high school level, at the professional level, but we're missing it for the most part. Mm. And I just don't think kids are getting it, seeing it, and understanding. And maybe coaches aren't either. Maybe, they, you know, at the college level, you, <laughs> your wins and losses decide your, your job sometimes, and that's just the way it is. But I don't want to beat it to a dead horse. The, the point is, is we got to get back to team thinking and, and back to actually what the word culture means, part of a team. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Let's go back to your lifting real quick, because obviously this is a strength podcast. <laughs> so you started training at 12 years old. 
and I know you said it wasn't like super serious, but right. when did you get serious? When you're at Cortland? Yes. I wasn't there when you guys were lifting. So what was your lifting like at Cortland? Um, I mean, it was relatively a well-integrated program uh, created by one of our athletic trainers, actually. Um, it was a normal, I guess, a normal program. You know, right. we would have our we'd have our leg days, we'd have our upper body days, our you know our, our push pull days. Um, we'd uh, lift probably four or five days out of the week. I think three or four of those were team mandated lifts, and then one day you had a lifting partner um, that you would meet um, on a Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was there, we used to run on Friday mornings at six a.m. Um, Sounds fun. Well, we used to do a lot of conditioning back then. We used to run. We used to do long distance. We used to, we used to do sprints. We used to do stairs. Um, every day. I mean, it was every day. It was every day in practice. You know, we yeah, did yeah. that when you when you were oh, playing. Yeah. Uh, so we had a really integrated, well well planned out um, lifting program. Which, well, that was my first experience with it. Right. Really focusing on you know certain body parts and certain movements and certain actions that help you with baseball. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just grown from there. I, I know. Well, what What do you think helped you, just specifically on the field, from the strength training, or De was there anything? Definitely, definitely my lower, my lower, getting my lower half strong. You know, I, I caught right squatting, deadlifts, you know, leg extensions, even running to cut, you know, keep my legs loose and, and and flexible. And I stretched a lot in college. Yeah, yeah. I mean, me and Andy Gardner, he was my lifting partner for three years. Um, well, no, two years because I played with him two years. Not a better lifting partner in yeah. the world, you know. One of the, arguably the best hitter ever to come out of Cortland, if not one of the best. You yes. know, you, you put, if you, you can put his numbers up with anybody at that school. Um, but we stretched. I, I, my flexibility was huge because I I never got hurt. Thankfully, right. I think that that was a testament to my 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 flexibility and my in and, and my uh, um, and combined with my strength. Um, I would say my lower, keeping my lower half strong okay. was, was, cause I, if I cut my lower half strong, my arm was fine, you know, cause right. my lower half would be strong. It wasn't, you know, I, I would always use my lower half, obviously to help me throw, to help me catch, obviously, you know, that's, that, that goes without saying, but, um, yeah, definitely. I really focused. I was always big on lifts, on benching and like biceps when I was younger, right? The, 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 the bro lifts, you know, but well, like at Cortland, we did have a statement that. That baseball was ninety percent chess. That's Johnny that, G. Meta. I know. That's Johnny Shout G. out Johnny G. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he hit the ball a long way, so you can say uh, Nick Serio has research that has evidence to support that claim. Yeah. So we know yeah. it's true. Yeah, but my lower half being strong was was key. Okay, I've been asking people this once in a while. What didn't work from the weight room or conditioning to the field, if anything? Maxing out. Next um, question. Maxing out, getting getting too bulky. Yeah, getting too strong. I mean, I say too strong, but getting too bulky. Um, you know, that's when your shoulder starts. You know, that's when you get some your shoulder pain or your joints start to hurt, your elbow hurts or whatever. You know, you, you're not as flexible as you should be, and yeah. then that turns into a pulled muscle. And that turns into a lingering issue. You know, um, I learned that the hard way. I learned that in high school the hard way. I hurt my arm because I was lifting like an idiot. Thankfully, it wasn't a, a bad injury. I was able to rehab, and it, you know, I, I never hurt my arm again. Thank God after that. But um, I learned that the hard way early on. So I, at, at Cortland, you know, I always went heavy, but you know, I I tampered it down, and then I learned it again the hard way when I was an adult. Um, but uh, yeah, probably getting too strong, too bulky, not not flexible yeah. enough. You know, it's it's something that there's just so much. You know, from the you came up from you came down or from Saratoga down here today, mm -hmm. thirty minute drive. You probably you probably didn't even notice. You probably passed ten strength. Yeah. centers you know it's great i mean it's awesome that we have access to this but my question to everybody and, and not not specifically to you right now is like what is the purpose right if if maxing out if you felt maxing out made you a better catcher or a better hitter do it right but a lot of times listen I, I work with college i've worked with professional i work with high school and i'll ask them why are you doing it right do you feel like it's making you better of course i'm a strength coach i believe in strength right i've maxed out probably more than any athlete and I've had to learn it the hard way several times, right. but you know, it's just the, the point is, is you found something that was working for you. It worked yeah. and you, you had, you're another person telling us, oh, hey, maxing out wasn't the answer for you. It, I'm not saying maxing out is wrong. We do it just in a different way here. Right. And I, saying too strong is an odd, is an odd term, I guess. I guess 
trying to get strong in the wrong way. You know, trying, yeah. you know, like, like keeping my flexibility and having lean, lean muscle mass and lean strength benefited me more as, a, as an athlete than when I tried to get way too big and bulky because I thought I had to get on the, the barbell bench and do 225 for 25 or get 315 up for five. You know, yeah. that didn't help my shoulders. That didn't help no. anything. So, um, you know, yeah, I learned that again, I learned it the hard way, but when I got more flexible and I had more, I guess, um, you know, put on some lean muscle mass is when I became, when I maximized my athletic ability. Okay, let's go into the lean mass because we, we talked about it in the beginning about bodybuilding common sense. So, I don't know, how long ago was it? Five years? Six years? I started bodybuilding common sense in the fall of 2015. Okay. Just talk about when you started it to the point now because you've been doing it for a while. Well, I, I, you know my love affair with bodybuilding common sense. Yes. Since 2015, I probably did those 26 weeks seven times. I mean, I've done them over and over and over again. I've gotten to the point where I've gotten to know myself well in the gym enough where I can manipulate the workouts. I can manipulate yeah. the weeks. I can manipulate the reps and the, and the exercises that I know help my body as I get older. Um, fasting and bodybuilding common sense and knowledge of nutrition, all largely based on conversations with you. And that it was your, that was your workout regimen yeah, yeah. that you gave me. Maximize my health post baseball. I got, I mean, when I was living with you and Alex at, in 2014, 2013 and 2014, we were lifting like savages, going to Taco Bell every Sunday night, oh. spending like $25 at Taco Bell. Every Sunday night we went to Taco Bell. Oh, I remember. And, you know, on the road, oh, you eat like T6. a savage, you eat Domino's, yeah. you, eat, you, have, you, have, you have snacks on the bus, you go to Golden Corral three times a week, and, you know, so you eat, second eating, time Golden but we were Corral's also working out. I ballooned. Podcast. I ballooned in 2014, my highest weight, I was 265. Wow. Yeah. I was a big... 265? I was a big boy. And not, in the, not in the greatest wow, way. Wow, wow, okay. Not in the greatest way. Yeah. I was lifting with yeah. you and Alex. I was lifting heavy, and I was doing very well, but my body hurt right so i knew i had to make a change and then 2015 after you left you, know, you started working for um nick down at uh um athletes warehouse and you started you you wrote your own program and i was i remember our conversation i mean Junior, something's got to change yeah here. yeah i just turned 30 not that i was feeling 30 because i you know i don't really believe in that but i needed to make a change i couldn't lift the way i did i couldn't eat the way i did anymore and Again, I started the intermittent fast, thanks to Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Mm -hmm. I started to work out with your, with your um, workout regimen, the bodybuilding common sense, and I learned a lot more about nutrition. And it's a revolution. It's, it's really just, I'm healthier than I've ever been. Yeah. Even as when I was an, I'm eating better, you know, I feel better. I, you know, I just, I feel like I'm as strong. And I know my, you know, my body, I just feel better in general, you know? Yeah. So it's just, it, that was the testament to bodybuilding common sense. That started it, working out the way you, yeah. working out the way you taught me to work out there, you know, higher reps, lower weight, control the movement. It's, it's what all my workouts are based on now. There is, I want to share one statement when, this is from Robbie Andrews, when, <laughs> I think it was when everyone came up and we played volleyball at my parents' house, uh -huh. maybe what was that, three years ago maybe? I don't yeah. know. At least three years ago. Yeah. But we were all playing volleyball. It was, it was warm out. We all had our shirts off. And Robbie states, wow, Z's ripped. I got to get ripped. Mm. And it was like, it was not that you needed reassurance that you were like jacked up, but like Mike's jacked right now. You started it in 2015. It's now 2024. Mm. It's not just my program. The program that I gave you just helped you experiment. But the point is, it's been nine years right. of you consistently showing up. You have a guide. You've experimented with it. You know how to manipulate it, like you said. People are forgetting that. People want to just show up here, and it's like, oh, I want to come in once. Yeah. Once? You, you want to work out 12 times, and no. you think that's going to do anything? You've been doing it for nine years. And yes, you're in a routine with it now, but it's been nine years. And yeah. I think... It's just another message of like from the lifting side of things. Yes, you fast. Yes, you've experimented with how you eat and stuff like that, and it's worked. But it's been over a course of time. It has to become a lifestyle for sure. You know, it has to become a lifestyle. And I loved your interview with Robbie, and I loved your interview with Alex. 
you know, two of my best friends, you know, again, both Cortland baseball guys. Um, they said the same thing, you know, it has to become a lifestyle. It has to become, you know, Alex and me and Matt Tone, another Cortland baseball yeah. guy, we talk about lifting all the time. You know, we, we, we you know, we'll, we'll talk, you know, we all, we all go to the same gym, different times, but, um, you know, we'll share a workout this, and, you know, I'll talk to Alex about, you know, hey, what'd you do here? What do you do for biceps? Or what do you do for chest? You know, Alex is, a, he's a mutant of a man anyway, and so is Tone. Um, so, you know, we all, we've all, it's all become part of our lifestyle, staying in shape as we get older, because it's, it was ingrained into us, but we've, 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 we've changed our ways, mm -hmm. you know, we eat differently. Again, I don't want to be the dead horse. We eat differently, we lift differently, we live differently, you know. Um, you know, we still like the occasional beer, we like the occasional drink, yeah. we like to, you know, we howl at the moon every now and then, you know, but it's, it's a lifestyle, and um, it's just... Um, it's, I all right now I'm 39, I'm single and I want to have, get married, have kids one day. I want longevity now. For sure. You know, I'm thinking about family down the line yeah. where I'm 39 years old, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I need to, I need to stay healthy. Absolutely. You know, and I think everybody does. I, I feel, I don't know. I don't want to get in the weeds, but I just feel everybody should, everybody, it should be, we've allowed way too much to come into society that says it's okay to be out of shape mm -hmm. and i won't get any more in the weeds because we yeah, can go another an hour. hour it's okay to be out of shape it's okay if you're this okay but it's not no. okay right it's not it's not okay to give up you have one body you should be able you, sh you should keep it as healthy as you possibly can i understand mm -hmm. some people have issues and they have health health concerns and, and they might not be able to do what i can do thankfully you know, I don't have any injuries or, you know, or debilitating injuries that keep me out of the gym or, or, or affect me in other ways in, in, my, in my personal life. But I just think it's so important to keep yourself healthy and, and active and moving, you know. Sure. It's just, I know that kind of digressed into that, but um, it just becomes, it becomes a lifestyle. And again, I know bodybuilding common sense wasn't the only factor, and it's, but it was a big factor. Yeah, no, it, it, and having friends like you and Matt and Alex and Robbie – that are healthy and active, they keep me, they, you guys keep me motivated. It's a good, it's a good segue to kind of get towards the end of this, but the, the last thing I, I had was to talk about habits, but it, it kind of starts with, you go to Cortland, you start to learn your values, you get discipline, you learn consistency, you learn how to work hard, you coach with Coach Brown, you, you see what it's like to grind, you know how to prepare, all of these things, you get the bodybuilding common sense, and like it's like, com, com, for years, you've just been getting better and better and better and better, right? Like, we, we have a conversation probably at least once every two weeks, right? We're on a mm -hmm. phone call, and we always come back down to like, man, we got to get in the gym. Like, w these are our habits. Him and I, I mean, I learned it from him. You've been going to the gym at 5 o'clock for years, right? Yeah. For years. For years, you've been waking up, going at 5 o'clock. You, you, you fast. You, you have your habits checked. And like, yeah, it is nice when, when you have friends who we can talk about these things, and we, and we have these similar lifestyles, but... I mean, just think about the times that we hang out. Z lives in Rochester now. I'm obviously in the Albany area. When we see each other, there's some kind of exercise going on. Yes. On my wedding day, him and I were in the sauna. Yeah, right? we were. We were in the sauna for, like, before the whole thing because we needed to do it because that is, like you said, that's become part of our lifestyle. And I think the habits piece is, is what you're hitting on. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to get these final two. I've been asking everybody. So the first one is advice, and it can just be one tip. Advice specifically for athletes, athletes who want to play college baseball, want to get, play at the next level. What advice do you have for the current athlete today? Find someone who's done it, done it at a high level and talk to them. You know, love multiple that. people. Love that. Multiple people. You know, talk to them. Um, ask them what made them successful. Ask them what they would change about their baseball careers or mm. their, their athletic careers. It doesn't have to be baseball. It could be football. It could be any, any sport, male or female. Um, ask them what they did right, ask them what they did wrong, ask them what they would change. Um, and then just build your own, you know, get comfortable in your own routine. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would pick, you know, I would watch guys in baseball at Cortland. I would watch, watch guys on TV and I'd, I'd try things out and I would pick and pick and choose what I kind of wanted to emulate. And it worked for me, <clears throat> you know, have that confidence in yourself that, you know, you can kind of build your own persona in the game. Uh, whatever game it is, um, yeah, talk to people that have been there. Like, again, working out. I talk to you. This is your life. This is your job. You know way more than I do. I talk to Robbie. 
I talked to you know Nick Serio. Yeah. We have a group yeah. chat with Nick Serio. I talked you know I and I, you you know more than I do. So I ask you questions about that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to become a good college baseball player or a good baseball player in general, talk to good baseball players. Right. Right. I mean, there's a common there's a commonality in all of them. Um, so I think just get, get advice from people that have done it, done it at a high level and are successful. I think it's a great point. No, no one has said that yet. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. The last one is you're talking to the parents of athletes no. in today's world, <laughs> right? And you know, without berating them because parents are always, do, you know, they're doing the best that they can for their kid, but I just don't think they understand you know, from the perspective of their kid being an athlete. What advice or like even just tips do you have for parents of the today athlete? Um, I would say, again, not having kids at, not having kids at all, but definitely, you know, I don't have, my kids aren't playing any sports or they, you know, they, again, I don't, I'm not in that life. Don't feel pressured to force your kid into situations that they're not comfortable with in terms of, you know, maybe they don't want to, you know, maybe they don't want to play travel ball. Maybe yeah, it's not, right. maybe they're not ready for it. You know, mm -hmm. maybe they're not, again, eight, nine, 10 year old kids. When I was an eight year old, nine year old, a 10 year old, I stunk. I was not a good athlete, right? I was, I was a little chubby. I don't believe I, that. I was a little chubby, husky kid. I didn't move well. I didn't really like, I, I liked sports, but I wasn't good at them. Right. My father and my mother never really pushed me into them until I got interested in them, right? So I think as a parent, you just got to understand where your kid's at and not feel the societal pressure to push them to where other kids are at or where sports society tells you you should push them, right? If your kid's not physically, um, I guess, comparable to other 8-year-olds or 9-year-olds or 10-year-olds or 15-year-olds, hold them out of travel ball mm -hmm. maybe one more year. Let them get in the gym. Let them get their bodies back. You know, go throw to them. I mean, I, my dad threw me so many rounds of batting practice just to get my, you know, get my game better. Right, right. Where other guys were playing all these games, and I was out working on my game, and then would play, you know, a decent amount of games a year, but not not a crazy amount. Um, I would say just don't fall into societal pressure to push your kid past their limits, you know, because yeah. a the kids maybe get hurt. He might not be ready to face that competition, and then it, now he's now he's going to fail, and now he's going to be less confident. Right? You want to maximize, I guess, the, 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 the chances of your kids succeeding in sport. So you don't want to push them too fast or put them in a situation where they might not. Now, if you think your kid's good enough and, he's in the men, in, and they're in the mental, I say he, he or she is in the mental, um, they have the mental capacity and, uh, I guess, the approach that they want to compete against older kids or they want to compete against their, their peers, let them have it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but I think you know, don't fall in that pressure to... Keep up with the Joneses. You know, it's it's. I've seen I've seen kids who have talent at a young age just be destroyed, and they never live up to their, their mm -hmm. talent or their ability because their confidence was, was destroyed at 12, 13, 14. Right, right. Um, where if they were just if they were just handled better, it would have it would have worked out for them probably. Love that. We're gonna go eat. <laughs> Mike, thanks for coming down. Thanks for having Appreciate me. Appreciate it. Thanks, brother. Yep. This is the I Know Nothing podcast. See you later.